ask the sessions, you can either put any questions that you have in chat or um, send them directly to Mark because my screen will not be up. I'll be, I'll be looking at the presentation while I'm talking. So if you have any questions, but by all means, feel free to interrupt if, if, if it's relevant to what it is. This, this session is gonna be just a little bit different than the normal sessions. It's more of a lecture type of uh, presentation. It's to answer a bunch of questions that have come up recently and I'll talk about those in, in, in a minute. Uh, as always, uh, Mark, give us a wave. Mark's a technical guy. He knows how to, how to deal with all the bells and whistles in these programs. Mark is our recording guy. He records all the sessions, also takes all the material. He posts them on the uh, OC Callers website. Um, we'll put up that uh, link to that address a little bit later. Uh, that has all of the sessions that we've done, all of the uh, sessions, I th or most of the sessions that Don Beck has done, I believe, as well as the presentations from the GSI Caller School. A lot of really good resources up there. And where are we here? Good. We got Betsy coming in. And it's now the We lost your audio. The host is... <laughs> you muted me, Mark. Yeah, <laughs> I was trying to click Betsy and she disappeared and it clicked you. <laughs> Hang oh, on. What happened here? Hang on, what's going on? Have you got my PowerPoint presentation up? Yep. Yes? Yes. yes? yes. Okay, one of the things that we're going to be talking about today is patter. Now I'm not talking about patter calling, I'm talking about just the use of patter or the, the chanting or the rhythms of square dancing. And we're going to go a little bit into the background, but just to let you understand what's going on, uh, I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one sessions with a number of callers and we've had about 14 over the last month. And a few of them have all brought up exactly the same problem with their uh, caller mentors or advice from other callers. And that is they're taught to say things in between the movements because they need to work on their timing. So they're taught something like swing through, come a two by two, boys run to the right you do, to, to fill in that kind of rhyme and reasoning. And then a little bit later on, they're told, oh, you got to work on your timing. You got to lose that filler words because it doesn't fit in with the music. And they've got a dependence on saying this stuff because it's become a habit, but nobody's actually explained why we fill in these things, why we don't fill in, uh, what patter is, what these rhyming chants, because you'll get some of these callers that'll go there, you know, chicken in the bread pan, picking out dough, swinger high and swinger low and away, you know, and it sounds really fantastic. And when you try to do it, it falls apart. Well, there's a reason for it. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So you understand what patter is and why patter is. So what you have to remember is patter calling is a style. It's an art and, and just like any art, each caller has to be unique. All the brush strokes are as unique to a painter as how a caller calls is unique to a caller. It's very possible to copy and replicate brush strokes of an artist and duplicate the paintings. It's equally possible to rep replicate and mimic the calling and patter styles of an individual caller, but that's not what you want to do. So, I'm going to digress here and start thinking art. So we're gonna have a little bit of an art lesson at the start. So the best way to approach this idea is think of yourself uh, and think of your pattern calling as a work of art. For instance, Van, Van, Gogh, Van Gogh or Van Gogh, depending on where you're from, but Van Gogh, he painted the painting Starry Night. Uh, his technical limitations were the canvas, the paint brushes, the color, just like in calling, we've got technical limitations. The canvas was fixed. It wasn't influenced. We couldn't change it. The paint was limited by what material was available. The brushes were, you know, a choice of sizes and styles and things like that, but they were all fixed. He had to take all of this stuff, mix his own colors to his own shape and mix the colors to find the hues that he wanted. His style, however, was influenced by those people that he admired at the time, such as the Dutch painter Millet or Rembrandt or even Toulouse Lautrec. Uh, probably one of the most influential in that impression or the neo impressionist style was uh, Paul Gauguin. But when it really comes out is Paul Millet. 
his style of landscaping and people. And I'm going to come back to him for a specific reason. So you can see the influence of all these people in Van Gogh's development of his own style. But when you compare his works to others, you can also see he's unique. And he takes the strengths and techniques from others, and he built his own way of painting. Okay, so you got to ask, why is this important? You know, why would I be talking about artwork rather than square dance? So just bear with me. Okay, consider these three photographs. This is Van Gogh's painting of Starry Night. So can you see the difference really between number one, number two, and number three? Just take a second, have a look at them. So in the first painting, you've got all these swirls and light above a flame or a grass tower or something in the foreground. Nobody really knows what it is, but it's dark and the lights are on over a small village at the foot of the mountains. In the second painting, you've got an identical painting in hue and color, but it's a little more vivid and your eyes are drawn more to the center of the painting than, and, and the village. Than, than the night sky and everything else. And then you look up and everything is just sort of separated. In the third painting, you have very clear and clean lines, which brings the entirety of the work into focus. You can clearly see the village, you can see the hamlet ledges, you can, you can see the lights and the darks of the town and the sky is clarified, it's better defined. And you can even you know, see and admire the painting subject components in clear detail. Now, in all of these paintings, you can see the influence of Gauguin, you can see the influence of Millet, but it's nothing like any of their works. The subject that Van Gogh did is, is unique. It's drawn in his own paintings. Now, why am I putting this up? Well, we have to look at value. What's an original painting worth? Okay. This is what your pattern needs to be, like a painting. A Gauguin will sell for about $300 million at an auction. A Millet, maybe between 17,000 and 60,000, where Van Gogh's uh, Starry Night estimated at $100 million. And yet Millet was the biggest influence on all of them. Millet had a bigger influence on painting and market values of paintings and was influential to both Gauguin. And he was, uh, as one of, uh, one aspect of, of Van Gogh's paintings, he, very influential, somehow Gauguin's paintings are worth much, much more than Millet's paintings. Uh, uh, Van Gogh is, is, is way up there. And both of them, they took the best of the others and made it their own unique style, but the biggest influence on all of them was Millet. Well, this is what callers need to be as well. Callers need to develop their own style. So if we look at the one on the left, that's an original Van Gogh. Well, that's not, but it's a picture of an original Van Gogh. That's worth $100 million. The one in the middle is a 100% accurate print. It's worth about $60. And the one on the right is a Mel Wilkerson duplication, probably worth about 50 cents because that's about the cost of the paper it takes to print it out. They all say exactly the same thing, but which one would you rather have, you know? An original by Mel Wilkerson might actually be worth something someday if I ever become famous. But me, me copying another artist is not going to be worth anything. And that's the same as you doing your pattern. Okay. This is what pattern needs to be. It needs to be influenced and styled, but truly unique to you. Uh, while Millet may be a better landscaper and Van Gogh's abstracts look like they were painted by a five-year-old in daycare, uh, the value is unique to the artist and it's very memorable to the presentation. The same applies to your pattern calling. It's true that most dancers will not remember what you called in the pattern, they will not remember the flow. They will not remember the choreography. They will not remember the rhyme or any of that because they'll be focused on leaving the floor, hopefully singing and humming the last phrase of that singing call, which drew everything together. I can guarantee you, however, if you don't have style, you don't have memorability, you don't have good flow and all those things that go into your patter to make it work, even though it's easily forgotten, they will remember it. Unfortunately, they're gonna be remembering your patter for all the wrong reasons. And that's why we're gonna be talking about patter. Like any artist, patter has limitations. The artist has canvas paint, the need to get the message understood, and he takes what he has to get it out there. Your limitations are exactly the same when you create a square dance work of art. Your limitations include the choreography, the defined actions which make the specific timings. Uh, use them wrong or push too hard or change the timings, it doesn't work. 
Another limitation is the music, the beat, the structure, the rhythm is all fixed and you need to follow that by for both the callers and the dancers or it doesn't work. The program restrictions, you're listed to the number of movements uh, that are usable at each program level. And of course, another uh, limitation is your judgment. You need to ensure your creation is understood and accepted by the target audience. You can't just say words and hope that they understand because they're on the program. You've got to say it in a way that they understand it. These are the things that you can't change. You can select your music, but it's once you've chosen, it's fixed. Your choreography is specifically defined, but you can choose where to apply it. The numbers of movements you choose are dictated by the program and the message that you want to deliver. Your pattern creation is limited to the ability of the target audience to understand your message. It's up to you to make that message clear, and it's up to you to paint in the enhancements, but you've got to make that message clear first. To do that, you need context. So like all great works of art, the audience doesn't really appreciate it until they put a context to it after the fact. You know, this is usually the singing call which ties everything together and it makes the patter forgettable. And I'm serious about that. The singing call will tie your, your music, your choreography, everything together and confirm the message that you've been delivering. But it makes them forget the pattern. That's not a bad thing. Unlike the painting, however, consider, however, how unfortunately memorable your pattern would be if you fail at one or all of those fixed limitation items. Those skills are needed to overcome those immutable limitations in pattern calling. Even the best singing call in the world will make the dance will not make the dancers forget a bad patter. So let's look at patter and just see what it's all about. Patter calling is named that because it's a type of square dance calling in which the caller speaks words or chants words on a musical pitch, hopefully in harmony with the tune. Now, historically, this was a combination of movements, uh, movement declaration being inclusive of what was called rhyming couplets. The historical chant format is still carried through today's in today's modern square dancing, but a better way to understand it is to think of it in two parts. The first part is the dance direction, and the second part is a supplementary filler. And it's called that mainly because it fills in those four or eight beats of the musical phrase to which the dance or direction applies. So if you say square through and it get four hands around you do, that's a rhyming couple. It fills in that blank spot. And we've all heard couple rhymes from time to time. They make the dancing more enjoyable. They make it memorable without interfering with the dance itself. Uh, a good example is um, do the right and left grant every other girl with every other hand. Okay, Don't be afraid of it. It's quite normal that callers will supplement their dance action with extra words. But these words fall into two categories. There's helper words and flow filler. There we go. There's helper words and flow filler. And then there's whimsy words. That's whimsy to fill in the musical phrase. This is usually done for timing purposes for both the callers and for the dancers. Now there's this old, old adage that filler words are killer words. That's both true and false. And like any other tool that you have, if you use it incorrectly, it'll make achieving the desired result very difficult to achieve. So to put it simply, if all you have is a hammer, that everything else becomes a nail to be hit. Patter calling is not a hammer. And I'm not talking about choreography. I'm not talking about the record. I'm talking about the pattern, the stuff that you use to flesh out the movements. Patter is a tool. And then when it's used effectively, it'll significantly enhance your dance and it'll significantly enhance your presentation. So in order to understand this, we're gonna start working backwards and looking at these two categories of filler. And we'll start by looking at the origins and the reason behind it. And it's much, much more than just the need to fill in dead air. Okay. Um, there's a fellow named Phil Jameson. He was on one of Don Beck's, uh, sorry, Tony Parks was on one of Don Beck's sessions. Phil Jameson wrote a lot about traditional square dancing. Uh, and if you want to log on to the Square Dance History Project, uh, you'll, you'll find a lot of information about that as well. But what I'm going to talk about is an overview to get a basic understanding of what we do and why we do it. And what you do with the material from there is entirely up to you. Okay, so typically most callers will augment their choreographic commands with either flow directions with extra words, or they'll make the call lines fit into the four beat musical phrases. So let's look at tradition. Traditionally, these words would seem to border on absolute nonsense as far as a particular meaning. Uh, you know, individually, 
and they had absolutely no meaning to, to the dance, but that's not true. Although what was being said may have seemed like nonsense, the theme or the filler words were used to convey the reason for the dance or an event, or even just tie into a lifestyle choice, such as a spring dance, a harvest ball, a wedding, or generally something to match the life and times of the area where the dance was being called, such as farm life, a mining town or timber. Those fillers would be geared to draw the audience into the activity and make them feel like they were part of the dance. Now, a lot of that's disappeared with the onset of singing calls in the late 40s and 50s, uh, because the singing call became the tie and the patter sort of just became flump and filler and whimsy. But the tra tradition is still kept alive by uh, 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 many brand new callers and a lot of traditional callers. The issue is many of these brand new callers do not know or may not know why they say what they're being told to say. It's so much more than filler. And if you understand it, you can use it better. So consider the spring dance where now the calves have all been thrown, the colts are out on the farm, the community is getting together for a spring dance, and you hear phrases such as join your hands and make a big ring and circle the left like anything. Got fields to plow, got wheat in the sack, halfway round and the boys turn back. Swing her high and swing her low. Take her home and promenade home. The sheep are sheared and wool's real fine. So you swing yours and I'll swing mine. Uh, the old call calls and the yearlings ball, head swing, across, or head swing the one across the hall. These are little rhyming couplets that were there. It, it sounds nonsense, but what is really being said to the audience listening in is, hey, winter's over. It's now spring. You know, these old traditional rhyming couplets come into the phrases and each action is followed by these seemingly nonsense words. But what the caller is doing, he's tying everybody at the dance and the community together. Spring is here. The fields are already plowed. We've got the seed ready. The sheep are sheared and the wool's ready for carding. And now we've got the sheep back out in the field making more wool. The calves are all born and now they're ready to take that little break before all the hard work of summer comes to bear. So what the caller is doing is effectively telling the story and pulling it all in to draw on the audience to make them feel like they're part of that social life and structure around them. It's a social commonality that ties the shopkeeper to the farmer, the cloth makers to the shepherds and the ranchers to the town folk. It is so much more than just nonsense. It's part of theming. And we've had a lot of sessions of theming. This is where it comes from. Okay. Humor was also something that was associated to the activities. For instance, wedding humor was always the, one of the biggest draws, a wedding square dance traditionally was one of the biggest draws. And of course, the prime target was always the groom. Okay. Uh, for instance, a, a wedding couplet, uh, and I still use this one myself periodically, is Alaman left with your left hand, back to the partner, right and left grand, like a lefty groom and a bow-legged bride, and get her back home, promenade side by side, and so on and so forth. You know, his, his heels kicked up and her foot's down, now stay at home and swing around. You know, all of these other things that come into. Now, it sounds like nonsense. It sounds like timing fluff, but it's not because the humor is reflective of the nuance of the roast of the, of the groom. It basically says, congratulations on your marriage. Guess what? You can't look at girls anymore. You've got a wife now. She's your boss. You try and kick up your heels. She's going to put her foot down and you're going to be in big trouble. It's telling a story with the dance that every draws everybody in. All the guys are going to laugh at him and they're going to say, yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. All the girls are going to go, yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. You, and then they're pointing to their part and says, you better listen to that too. All of that, it brings everybody together to join in the fun and the celebration to roast the groom, which is what weddings are all apart, you know, all about. I mean, the groom's got the easy part, put on a clean shirt, comb your hair, brush your teeth, stand there and shut up. That's, that's the pattern for the rest of your life, boys. Welcome to marriage. <laughs> in modern square dance calling, the pattern calling involved away from the more fixed and inspected routines into a what comes next is unexpected. This was essentially the creation of what we call hash calling today. It basically means that the dancers don't know what's coming next and the rhyme filler is usually missing. Thus the dancers have to keep the rhythms and the timing of the music and the beat and they have to know and understand a lot more than they used to. It's also one of the reasons why the patter story has disappeared as part of the dance team and why it's common for today's callers to follow a patter call with a singing call that reflects the theme of the dance rather than have to do the work. Those fixed songs do all the work for the caller and there is less requirement to fill in the hash as it were. Uh, the singing calls are rigidly structured to fit the choreographic phrase with the music. And here we go into the second type of patter filler, 
which is what's happening. And these are patter filler words or the helper words and filler words. And like patter itself, these are broken down into two categories as well. There's flow helper directions. This is a direction for the dancer. And then there's filler words to help the caller with his timing or her timing and delivery. And those are the two that we want to concentrate a little bit on. One of the most important things in calling is to ensure that the dancers can clearly understand what you want them to do. So a caller's got to strive to give them the best chance of success and at the same time, give them variety with a little bit of challenge, a clear understanding of what they're supposed to do. The trick of doing this is to successfully convey the message that when needed to give the dancers a clue to solve the puzzle that you're presenting for. And then what you do is you wean them off the clues so that they're able to solve that puzzle themselves. And that is most often done by a prompt. We do it all the time. So consider this, bow to the partner, bow to the corner, do paso. Ladies chain, ladies chain, promenade, okay? Nothing wrong with that, perfectly clear, message is understood, timing's fine. Imagine the chaos if I went to any of your clubs above basic today and called that exactly like that. What would your dancers do? You know, probably go, do paso, oh my God, where does a do paso end? What do I do? I haven't heard that in a long time. It's very, very clear what I want you to do, but it's not clear to the dancers for a number of different reasons. So I've got to help them out. So I use what's called flow filler. So imagine it this way, bow to the partner, turn and bow to the corner, face your partner, do paso, turn her by the left, turn corner by the right, go back to the partner with a courtesy, turn all four ladies, chain across. Turn that girl, chain her back to the partner, keep that lady, promenade home. I'm doing exactly the same thing. I've got exactly the same timing, but I've added a bit of flow filler to tell the dancers what I want them to do. A little bit later, I'll start weaning off of that. A little bit later, you know, when it comes to the do paso, I might just say left, right, partner, or something along that line. When you hear a do paso as it's defined, it's ending in a courtesy turn. How many people actually call a do paso and then just wait? You can't expect your dancers to remember, oh yeah, do paso ends with a courtesy turn. I haven't done that in a while. In this second example, the caller can also time the prompting to regulate the flow of the dancers because you everybody's got that one dancer that is not sure is just standing there waiting to be pulled. And you've got that other dancer that's just running through and trying to push everybody's timing off. So you can also use it to regulate the flow of the dancers to let them know where they should be, what's coming next, what they got to do, and it allows them to blend smoothly from one call to the next. Once the dancers are used to this, of course, then you weave, wean them off. You know, some common examples of filler that we have today are do a do side do, go back to back. Do an alaman left with your left hand, back to the partner. Swing through, go right and left, or swing through, go two by two, or a right and left through and turn that girl. Am I missed a slide there? Yes, I did. A right and left through and turn that girl. Spin the top, half, centers three, and the ends move up. How many of you have heard spin chain through, right hand half, centers go three, new centers trade, left three quarters, back to the wave. It times out its filler and its flow. If it's done correctly, it works, it's perfect. If it's done incorrectly, oh my God, you have big problems. These types of flow fillers are helpful to the dancers when learning and helpful to newer callers to ensure not only the dancer timing is correct, but the caller timing on delivery is correct. However, they are designed to be weaned off of by both callers and dancers when no longer required by the dancers, okay? And notice I'm very specific, when no longer required by the dancers. They're a tool to help callers with timing, but when the dancers don't need them anymore, you've got to stop using them too. Okay, filler words that help the caller with delivery. And this is what a lot of problems that we have right now. This is what a lot of the sessions, uh, 10 out of the last 14 sessions, one-on-one -on -one I've had with new callers, all brought up the, the point that they're told to use this to improve their timing. And then they're told, oh, you shouldn't use filler words like that, or your timing's wrong. You got to fix your timing, but they don't explain why or what's happening. This category of patter can include helper words, 
uh, but can also include the more traditional rhyming and nonsense filler or expressions and phrases that are designed and intended for use by callers to help their timing, delivery, when to say the word, their command, how long to say it takes to say the movement, and the execution timing, how long it takes the dancers to do the movement, and when to give the next command. That's what these filler words are for, is to make sure that those things are accurate. Excuse me. Okay. This is the area that many callers are taught to do, but it's never explained why they're being told to fill in these blanks, nor is it being taught how to distinguish between flow filler when it's needed, caller filler when learning, but more importantly, when to use it and when not to use it. It's this area that we're going to um, look at, and it's in this area that you develop whether or not you're going to be an artist or a forger. Are you going to be a Van Gogh or just another cheap Mel Wilkerson imitation of an original? <coughs> The decision that you got here is entirely yours, but to make it fair, you've got to ask yourself a decision. You know, what is being asked of you as a caller? We've all heard that expression, filler words are killer words. I alluded to, uh, I alluded to it earlier, but intentionally I did not expand on it. The reason is in discussion with 11 callers on these one-on-one -on -one sessions, it, it got summed up in, in four sequential points. Point one, I was taught to say this for the dancers. Okay, valid point. I was taught to use these words to make sure my timing is right. Also a valid point. But then we get into, I was told to fix my timing, but nobody's explained to me what's wrong or how to fix it. I was given filler words to fix my timing. Later, I was criticized for using what I was taught and it was ruining my timing. You know, those are, those are the issues that a lot of new callers face. It's one of the reasons why I really dislike the expression filler words or killer words. I'm going out on a limb here and saying, in my opinion, there's nothing wrong with filler words. There's nothing wrong with them. Filler words are just a tool. They're just another tool in the toolbox and are an extremely valuable tool if used properly. And they're an extremely harmful tool if used correctly, just like any tool in the toolbox. Remember what I said, if all you have is a hammer, then everything else is a nail. Filler words are a tool like a hammer. A hammer is useful sometimes and you need a hammer, but sometimes you need a paintbrush and sometimes you need a tiny little finishing tool just to make it perfect. You can't use a hammer for everything. So to carry this analogy through, if, if filler words are a hammer and you want to attach things together with nails, great, use a hammer. But when I want to finish it, I don't use the paintbrush like a hammer. I use it like a paintbrush. And I don't use the hammer like a paintbrush. When I teach and call, I use flow filler when I feel are necessary to help the dancers as part of the pattern rhythm. I try to wean them off when they're no longer necessary. I also use filler words to assist with timing and rhyming, pun intended, uh, while the dancers are doing the movements. But it's important that you never sacrifice good choreography for a good rhyme. Never do that. Another important tool to learn is dead air. It's okay to have dead air. Let the music fill in the gaps. Tony Oxendine was here and he gave a great presentation on that. Let the music carry it. That's what it's there for. A good piece of music doesn't need to be filled in. It'll fill itself in, okay? And if you've got something like that, you don't need to prompt, nor do you need to regulate the speed because the music will do that for you. It's important that you understand the tools that you have and how to use them properly. You don't have to use each tool every time, especially when it's not required, because doing so often makes things worse. When you use the tools correctly, you'll hear success. So I've, I've just picked five callers here. Uh, when I listen to these callers, I've got Don Beck, Mike Sikorsky, Tony Oxendine, Ken Tucci, and Eric Hennerlow. Okay, now th these are five callers and I just did some Google searches and listened to their calling and, and whatnot. But I chose them specifically because one, I admire all of them. And I actually, I'm one of those people that actually pays a lot of attention to pattern. Quite frankly, I analyze a lot of how the pattern and the singing call to go together. The theming is often in the choreography. And most of the time I can figure out what the focus movement or the focus sequence will be that's gonna be reflected in the singing call, what that's going to be. I also listen carefully uh, to what's in between. So I'm going to just look at each of these callers a little bit. Okay. And this is by no means a criticism or a critique or anything else. Every one of these, I wish I was as good as any one of these. Okay. Tony uses the word honey. 
Okay, it uses a fair bit to tie things together, like boys run around your honey, and then it's followed by a right and left through and turn your honey. You know, he'll do a boy is run to the right around your honey, bend the line and a right and left through and turn your honey. He ties that together. A common expression that he also uses is flutter wheel. This is about the only real rhyming scheme you hear. Uh, and he'll say flutter wheel. The more you dance, the better you feel. Other than that, in his patter, all he uses is specific directional prompts or indications to the dancers, such as uh, boys in the middle make a wave if he's got you there differently. And no filler words are ever there. Uh, until he does something like a right and left grand and then they'll go right and left grand grand right and left right and left and meet that girl and promenade home and when you get there and then he's right back into it tony is a master of using the music giving very little guidance to the dancer unless there's something a little bit different which will require him to prompt the flow for the dancers once or twice and when it's no longer needed he doesn't do it anymore he lets the strength of the music carry the pattern through don beck Don Beck uses very little directional flow prompts other than what is minimally, ne blah, 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 minimally necessary for the dancers to succeed. For example, in parallel waves on a spin the top, he'll call something like spin the top and the next prompt will be meet somebody with a right and single hinge. He, he, he doesn't call spin the top single hinge. He'll give you that indication. Once they've done it a couple of times, he stops. Other than that, there's strong point commands for the movement. He, he, he gives that movement very, very positively. So you really have no choice. But he has a lot more rhyming pattern filler on the long flow movements like uh, right and left grand. His filler though is he actually talks to the dancers while they're dancing and he does it in a conversational way, almost like he's just, you know, uh, do the right and left grand. So how's it going today, Joe? You know, <laughs> this kind of thing. How he pulls it off is beyond me. He's a master of it. And if you ever get a chance to listen to Don or go, go through some of his old recordings, you'll hear all this, okay? Um, he'll have a conversation phrase such, uh, he'll even turn the, uh, the choreography into conversation, you know, do the right and left through. And when you do, can you send her back with a flutter wheel? You know, it's, it's like almost a question he's asking, and when you do that, yeah, and when you get there, why don't you pass through, please? You know, it's, it, it becomes a conversation with only an occasional filler on a good rhythm but non-dominant music. So if he's got really soft music, so he'll, he'll say something like chain down the line, why don't you turn that girl and then, and that's just to fill in. Otherwise, there's very little. Another one of my favorite callers, Mike Sikorsky. Okay. Mike often uses no filler or frill in this pattern. He has a straight up delivery of the command prompt and it's where and when it needs to be there. Usually in the pattern, you'll hear right and left through and turn the girl and that's about it. Other than a directional prompt, where needed, such as a half sachet veer to the left, he might say, boys take hands, hinge, or something along that line, or new center boys take hands and trade, and then cast right three quarter. He'll prompt you through the directions and it's just saying cast off or, you know, he'll do something and then they'll say, while the girls circulate instead of the end, you know, things like that. But if you listen to Mike, uh, you'll find he uses more filler and rhyming patter in his singing calls than he ever does in his patter call. When he does a singing call, you'll hear a lot of rhyme filler that isn't even in the singing call, but it's not there in his patter. He's very clear, crisp, and very concise. Uh, great to dance to. Ken Ratuzzi almost uses no filler or prompts with his calling, unless it's in the role of giving assisted direction to the dancers, okay? This is flow patter prompting, and it only seems to be used when necessary. He does, however, uh, like Don, use conversational filler on his patter with humorous directional prompts to indicate to the dancers. And, and it's, it's a rather unique skill that Ken has because it's quite unique. That particular delivery, and although I've, I've heard others try it, Ken's the only one I've ever he heard pull it off successfully. Uh, one of the examples is um, spin chain and exchange the gears. It's a plus move. Okay. He doesn't prompt you through it, but he'll say spin chain and exchange the gears. Okay. Who's the lead lady? She's got a lot of money. Follow her doesn't give any indication of what to do. He just said, who's the lead lady? She's got money, follow her. You know, it's just enough to say, ah, think about what you're doing. It brings a smile to the dancer. That lead lady knows where, you... and that's it. And Ken is the only one that can prompt an effective movement that I've found with a humorous anecdote that actually tells the dancers what to do without telling them anything. It, it's a very unique skill. And then I, I've included Eric Hennerlow in this because he's another excellent caller, but by contrast of all the other four, 
he uses an enormous amount of filler words in his pattern. He has, however, developed a unique style that the filler words do not interfere with the movements at all. Uh, rather, um, he uses the multiple peaks and, and troughs of his vocal range to make the patter filler part of the rhythm of the movement. It's, it, he's actually, if you, if you turn the music off, what he can do with his voice is absolutely incredible. He sharply contrasts from one extreme to the other. He uses a lot of filler on simple flow sequences to very little or none on the more complex movements, but he uses a different, a completely different voice inflection, usually that deep bass commanding voice that just makes you wanna do what he's telling you to do, and then he'll fill it in. Uh, an example of an opening sequence uh, to introduce the dancers that, it, this is, these are the movements, bow to the partner and the corner two, alamand left, do side do, men star left, turn partner right, Alamand left, right and left grand, promenade home. Now, it took me a while to go through this, but this is what he said. We're gonna bow to the partner, corner two, do an Alamand left with the corner, you know, come back, one, do a do side, do with a partner, four men, star by the left, go around that big old ring, turn a partner by the right forearm, turn a corner by the hall, do a left Alamand with the corner, man, I walk right in, do the right or left grand, 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 right and left, go round, hand over hand, go somehow, and then you promenade, go all, promenade round, go round that corner, take a little walk and settle on down, you do, and he's into the next, and it's so full, I can't do it. What I just did there does not give Eric justice. I mean, he, he's a master at it. It sounds like an awful lot, but he's got the ability and the vocal range and the inflection to make that background rhyme, filler, and chant feel so far separated from the actual command prompt of the movement that it flows beautifully. And if the music were to disappear, the highs and lows of his voice would keep you unbeat. You wouldn't even notice the music was gone, you know, except for those you know seemingly infrequent pauses where he has, actually has to take stop and take a breath. Um, forgetting to switch slides here. But that's that's the sequence. Bow to the partner. Those two lines at the bottom is the choreography. That's the delivery. And yet it works so perfect for him. If you want to hear something really good, there's a, I think it's at the uh, Southwest uh, Callers uh, Convention or Southwest uh, Square Dance, Washington State maybe. But uh, he did a duet with Mike Sikorsky, two completely different calling styles in pattern and they blended so perfectly. Okay. So we're gonna talk similar and different. Okay, although there's many excellent callers out there, I chose those five because they all have similarities on how they deliver. Each has his own distinct and unique style. And like artists, some are minimalists, some are landscape specialists, some are realists, and some are surrealists, where they wonder how, much, how in the heck do they fit so much into such a small space? Each caller adapts the style that best fits the audience so that the message is received correctly by the audience and it's interpreted correctly and enjoyed by the dancers. Having met them at least once or listened to them and presented on numerous occasions, most have stated that they were influenced by guys like Al Brundage and uh, Jim Mayo, Elmer Sheffield, Marshall Flippo, Bill Peters, and, and, and those type. I can tell you honestly, I am nowhere in the league of any of those. Okay? I can also tell you right now, I have begged, borrowed, or blatantly stolen ideas from all of them when it comes to pattern delivery. And I believe that I've come to develop my own style so that when dancers hire Mel Wilkerson, they enjoy Mel Wilkerson. They don't enjoy Mel Wilkerson trying to be Eric Hennerlau or Mel Wilkerson trying to be Tony Oxendine. I like to think I'm going to eventually be like Millet as a painter. I know I'm never going to be in their league, but I consider myself a fairly good caller. I know I've influenced a lot of people to develop their own styles. And of all my paintings may not be wonderful, great works of art yet, fingers crossed, <laughs> how I do it and what I've taught has hopefully shared and influenced others to become true artists in their own making. Now that may sound a bit boastful, but it's not intended. What I'm trying to get across is each caller, new or very experienced, will tell you they're always trying to get better at their craft and learn how to use their tools better. So one of the most crucial tools you have is patter. If your patter works and it's rhythmic and it's on point to deliver the message that you want to deliver clearly, accurate, and it flows smoothly, it doesn't matter if you are a minimalist, a realist, or an expressionalist, or a surrealist with your delivery. The dancers are going to enjoy your work and they will come back and see you often. 
Okay. So keep that in mind, find your own style. And if it's a lot of words and it doesn't interfere, then use a lot of words. If it's no words, then don't use any words other than the movements, but it's gotta be you. Now let's address this saying, cause I can't just leave it hanging. Filler words are killer words. As I said, I really dislike this expression and it would do every new caller a disservice if I didn't explain why that saying exists. When we're taught to call, we're often taught expressions uh, to help the timing of our delivery. We are unfortunately not taught three specific warnings that go with these filler words. So unfortunately, we are not taught that delivery timing is only to use the words, okay? We're not taught what delivery timing is. We're only taught, use these words, it'll help. You know, we're not taught why. Unfortunately, we're not taught what the words are specifically for, nor how to properly use them and why we're using them. And unfortunately, many of these words become habit crutches to the point that we just can't call without them and we become uncomfortable with dead air. So without these filler words to fall back on, dead air becomes really, really uncomfortable and we just gotta shove something into that blank spot. And unfortunately that really throws not only us, but the dancers out. And then somebody that told you to use this is now saying, don't use that, it's ruining your timing. You gotta fix your timing. <coughs> Excuse me. Delivery timing is the time you need to say the words before the completion of one movement and the execution of the next move. It's normally about two beats, sometimes more, depending on what it is. Square through is two, spin chain and exchange the gears takes a little longer. You don't wanna say that in two beats. Filler words are often taught to fill in the blanks to give you the rhythm to meet that delivery time. So square through, and again, four hands are around you do, and when you're there, do a do side do. Four hands around you do, and when you're there, okay, great. I got 10 beats, square through, at eight beats, I'm there, do a do side do. I've got the command, they finished the command at time exactly when they have to do the next movement. That's what you want. In other words, they're words that usually take two or three beats less than needed to complete one movement to give you a point of reference as to when to say the next command. So we've got uh, just a couple of examples. Head square through. From a static square, that's 10 be or 12 beats. And to get four hands around you, go all the way to the corner, Joe, do a nine beats, do si do. From a box, square through, four hands around that ring you do, meet those sides, I'm at eight, eight beats. I've got two beats, right and left through, two beats, they're right there to start. That command's given on exactly the right time. If, if the next call was a right and left through. Uh, swing through, come a two by two. Boys, run to the right you do. Okay, so in this case, the boys run was given a bit early, but the run to the right you do, that fills in, that takes us right to six beats. Ready to do the, the run. Swing through, turn half by the right and the center's left. Boys run. Half right, center's left. There's four beats filled in, boys run. Right on the sixth beat, they're ready to go. Right and left through and turn that girl. Pause, that's a breath pause. That takes four beats. Then you give the command, which is usually a two beat movement, six beats, that's the timing of right and left through. Circle to a line, halfway around, the head man break and the side man arch, six beats. Circle to a line takes eight beats. I've got two beats left to give the command and they're right there to do the next command. And the list goes on and on and on and on. That's what filler prompts is, but nobody's ever taken the time to explain that. Many new callers are given prompts like this as filler to assist in developing their timing delays from one movement to the next, but they're not told um, this type of directional flow filler, although sometimes helpful to the dancer, becomes a delivery crutch if it's overused and you find yourself unable to call without it. Remember that first example of do paso? It's one of the movements that should not need a filler prompt, but I doubt many of us can raise our hands and claim we've never heard it called without a prompt, uh, including ourselves calling it, like turn your partner left corner right back to the partner left to an alamandar or back to the partner courtesy turn. Sometimes it's right, sometimes it, it, it's wrong, but it just feels right to the dancers to do that. But if words are habits and you don't understand the delivery mechanism and how you're supposed to say them, they become a hindrance. And what happens is you've got the words stuck in your head, but you, 
you don't understand that the words are there for the timing. So think about this. Um, head two couples square through. And again, four hands around you go, go all the way to the outside two. And when you're there, do the right and left through. That would be so uncomfortable to dance because I'm going all the way to the outside two. Now they're standing. And then I say, and when you're there, do a right and left through. Okay, there's another four beats of standing before they can do the movement. Or swing through. Now we're a lot of people are swing through, come a two by two. Okay, but swing through, turn half by the right, center, turn half by the left. Boys, run to the right around that girl. And when you're there, bend the line. And you've got dancers go, uh, 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 okay. Poor delivery of these filler words that we're taught prevents good delivery of command prompts needed for smooth dancing. And remember what I said earlier, never sacrifice good choreography for a bad rhyme or, or good choreography for a good rhyme. If the choreography is good, you don't need to have the rhyme. You don't need to fill it in. If you are going to fill it in, make sure you fill it with the timing and you're filling it for the dancers, not for yourself. Alternatively, there's a collar crutch in developing the habit where we can't seem to say it some commands without these filler words. This is a real problem when the filler words are flow prompts and you ignore what you're commanding the dancers to do. The most common one of these, bend the line, go up to the middle and a come on, back and a right and left through. And you hear bend the line, go forward and back and a right and left through. Well, forward and back takes four beats if they're close, eight beats if they're far away. Usually they're far away, pass through, bend the line. They're gonna be far away, eight beats. One, two, three, touch, back, two, three, touch, right and left through, you know? But we go forward and back and a right and left through. Forward and back is, you know, two beats right and left through, you're there and they haven't even gone forward yet. Generally, this should be bend the line, one, two, three, four, forward and back, five, six, seven, touch, nine, 10, 11, touch, right and left through, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. I forgot 13, 13 in there, didn't I? <clears throat> that's, uh, that's because I limped. Yeah, yeah, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. But forward and back is so frequently used as a crutch, it's disregarded by many callers and dancers alike, which makes awkward dancing. And when the dancers do what they're told, or worse, when they do not do what the caller tells them to do, such as pass through, bend the line, go up to the middle and they come on back. And the caller gives them time, they go up to the middle and they stand there going, what's going on? And then a right and left through. Or alternatively, you'll say bend the line and a right and left through and they'll go forward and then they'll come back. And now they're way behind the music, okay? We have this tendency of getting six or eight beats of music when actually, if we call this properly, it takes 18 beats. That's at least 14 beats if the lines are close together of music that we're taking away from the dancers or we're telling the dancers to do, but we're not giving them music to do. So the final part of filler killer is the problem when a caller is told to stop using the filler words and prompts for the dancers, but is not taught how to use dead air. Okay. Nature abhors a vacuum, okay? And so do square dance callers, apparently. When a new caller is criticized rather than critiqued and coached, the propensity to just stop using filler words and start using that empty space just calls to them to fill that in. I, I've got an empty space, uh. Unfortunately, unlike Eric Hennerlow or Tony Oxendine or Ken Rituzzi and the others that have developed their own style to both fill and use these blank spaces appropriately, many new callers are just left hanging and they feel that I've been told to fill this in. I've got to fill this in. And then they start falling back into the rhyming couplets, which are not metered to the square dance choreography of today, because not everything to, square dancing traditionally was eight beats. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, new move. And that's those eight beat phrases. Well, square dancing today is two beat, three beat, five beat, seven beat, eight beat, 12 beat, it's all over hell's half acre. So you've got to be really, really cautious and careful and know your timing of the movement and know the timing of your fillers. This type of filling in in the rhyming couplets also, uh, it not only hampers the patter calling, but the patter rhythm, but it prevents really being fair to the music when you start doing singing calls. Because the crutch is gone and that big pothole of nothingness is there, we seem to want to fill it in. So we grab the nearest words that come into our mind and we fill in that hole, regardless of whether they fit or not. And this really hampers and hinders the delivery of the message that we want to give to the callers. 
and often the calls are lost in this attempt at witty repartee of effective filler. So go back and think about those old time rhyming couplets. They were there and they were practiced. They were themed for a specific reason. Bring that into your calling today. If you're gonna use filler in modern square dancing, the principle must be to achieve the same success. Even your impromptu filler, the stuff you make up on the spot is practiced beforehand. You may not know when you're gonna use it, but you've practiced using it. It's themed, it's delivered, it's delivered appropriately to achieve a specific person, a purpose. The reason is not to fill dead air. So if that's what you're using it for, stop doing it. It is intended to keep the rhythm and enhance the flavor of the dance. It's not random. Many callers today still use rhyming couplets or variation to fill in the big empties like right and left grand, weave the ring, or even square through. But little filler is used today other than directional prompts when necessary. Others use conversational filler like Don Beck or little indications of discussion filler, which has no rhyme, but it fits the conversational theme without interfering with the movement. Some callers talk to their dancers between movement effectively, and it just seems to be rambling, but it's not. They practice this. They know exactly what they're doing. And sounding random and sounding distracted is very hard, and it takes a lot of practice. It's an occasional thing, but believe me, something that they do like that has been very carefully considered before it's spontaneously used. Exceptional callers like Eric have the ability to use their vocal capabilities to turn filler phrases into dance music and still keep it separate from the commands. And you can bet that too is a well-practiced technique. Each of the callers I've mentioned before has developed their own style and technique. That's why dancers remember Don Beck about you know, he's, he calls something and he's talking about fishing on Martha's Vineyard while he's doing the pattern. You can't remember what he called, only that it was fun and they did it and they know about Don fishing. It's why Ken Rituzzi can say, follow that lady, she's got money. Well, I, you know, follow that rich lady. A terrible thing to say, but it's funny as hell. And when he says it, it makes sense. You know, um, you feel that somebody's having trouble. He got it sorted out and you're so happy you're suddenly home. Wow. You know, he, he'll actually make it seem like he's struggling. Uh, do this and, and then, okay, can you do this? And, you, you know, and to suddenly figure it out and it looks like every floor and he's pulling six different squares, dancing six dances, well, completely different. And, oh, got that sorted out. You feel so good that he sorted all that out when in, re in reality, he knew exactly what he was doing all the time. Callers like Tony and Mike seem seemingly walk you through the impossible with a, you know, a quick directional prompt where you're supposed to be. And even though it's a difficult task, you feel exonerated and wonderfully successful when all they did was actually add a few well-practiced and chosen filler prompts uh, to make it seem easy or to make the easy seem like it was difficult. And really all it was said was just a little something to help you get through it, said in such a way that it feels difficult, but it's really easy. And he'll do that. Tony does this a lot, and so does Mike. He'll call something, and it'll seem so complex and difficult. And then the next time he'll call it, he says, right, you're on your own now, and he'll call it. And you'll wonder why you had trouble, because it's so easy. Success. That's part of the showmanship. Each of these callers, I consider a master at their craft. Each of these callers will tell you they're still working every day to improve their craft. I also feel that I can say each of these callers will tell you to find your own way to do your pattern develop your own style. They can give you the tools, the same as I can, to show you how to do the work, but only you can figure out what you're gonna use those tools for and how you're going to use them. You can determine what tools you're gonna to use and how well you're going to use them. Patter words are filler. Filler and patter are a tool. And like any tool, they can be used properly for what they're intended, or they can be used incorrectly. It's your choice. And what you choose to do with them is your choice alone. Yep. All right. I got one for you there. Okay. Um, before, before we start there, um, I noticed no, my little chat, my chat window was going, were there any questions, Mark? No, I have no questions. Oh, wow. That's a first. Right. Does anybody have any questions or any comments or anything they'd like to add? I've, I've, I've got a comment uh, that sums up most of what you said. 
here in Germany we say, and probably in other worlds they say it too, everybody is born as an individual and still about 95% die as a copy. True. One of the important things also that I left out of this one, but it, it's terribly important. Uh, I was listening to a couple of the recordings of a couple of the European dances. And I noticed that a lot of the, the German callers and even the Swedish callers, they use filler in their movements and they use a lot of directional prompts. And at least I hope it's directional prompts because my German is very rusty and I don't know Swedish at all, but it's in a different language. So you look head square through and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. That yeah. I'm not. I'm not saying it that way to be disrespectful, but to an, an, a native English speaker, that's what it sounds like. Uh, yeah. you, you hear the same thing in Japanese. You'll hear square through, and then you'll hear directional prompts in Japanese. Uh, we had a, a, a Japanese caller came over to a dance here a while ago, and she was actually singing a song in Japanese. It was a Japanese square dance song. I wish I, I had a recorded. It. Absolutely beautiful. The words and everything else were in Japanese, but the square dancing was in English and it fits so beautifully. It's something that you have to remember with patter filler, especially if you're a traveling caller. And especially if you're an English traveling caller going to another, uh, another country. If your timing is not perfect with your filler and you start using it incorrectly, if I say a right and left through, right pull by and turn that curl. Well, they're gonna finish the right and left through, then they're gonna do a right pull by, and then they're gonna do another turn that curl, or essentially do two right and left throughs, which is not what you want. So this is where judgment comes in, and judgment is also a tool. You have to think about what you're doing. Be culturally aware. Well, there, there was a Swedish caller, Google probably will know him. Uh, he was very influential in Sweden, he brought a lot of square dances into square dance, but uh, his pattern calling uh, was terribly in timing uh, because he always had to use the full pattern that he was going to say, regardless of how long the move takes. Uh, hmm. you, you, you probably know Peter Muir? Uh, I've heard of him. I don't know him personally, I don't think. Um... Yeah, but I've I've, I've got a recording by him and uh, se several songs. And then he says, do a pass through because it is so nice to do. And then he came to the next call. Yep. <laughs> and th this is this is some of the things that we have. Uh, Yolanda, are you still with us? Oh, there you are. Yeah. Um, y Yolanda made made this, this comment and I uh, hope you don't mind me sharing it. But it was one of the things she was taught to use filler, like swing through two by two. And, but nobody explained how to say two by two. Nobody explained where to do it. It was picked up by listening and watching other callers. But as a new caller, there was critiques of, oh, you need to do something to fix your timing. Drop the filler words. And then another caller would say, use the filler words. And it was never explained why to use these filler words or how to use these filler words. And that's along the line of what you're saying, Guido. Filler words became a habit rather than a technique to assist, to be dropped. And that's the whole purpose of this. And I, I appreciate it was a lecture, probably boring as hell, but uh, it's a bit of a lecture to give the background as to why and what we're actually doing with filler. Because if you can understand it, you can better use the tool for what it's intended. If you don't know how to use the tool, don't use the tool until you learn. I see John waving his hand there. Yes, John. You're muted. Uh, I'm, I'm not muted anymore. I'm right here. <laughs> this, this falls, to me, this falls right along with the um, presentation Kip Garvey came last week where he talked about the mechanics for moving the people from one one group to the next group and all that all that inversions and conversions and all that sort of stuff or transitions and conversions and this when you started talking about the filler words and how to use the filler words to let's say you had a 10 10 beat move and you used eight beats with filler words then you had enough another two for the for the next command that that brought that brought it into me that made a whole lot more sense than just saying the filler words because I never realized 
what we were trying to accomplish with the filler words. So that that part right there really made you know brought it home to me that filler words are great and it's a good way to uh, fill in the space. But I never I never thought about the fact that you just leave uh, two spaces left for the next command. So there you go. That's what I got to say. Yeah, and it. it oh, thank you much for the comment because it is exactly what I was trying to get across. There is nothing wrong with filler words. They are a tool. But like any tool, they can be used incorrectly. Uh, what Kip was saying, and he gave some great examples, and I love the way you tied that in, John. When you're moving around, star through, pass through, and bend the line. You know, it's all timed in the delivery, and the rhythm of his voice will do exactly the same as pass through, bend the line, and a right and left through, and turn that girl. Do the right and left through, and when you do, you know, how you deliver it can be different, how you fill it in can be different or not filling it in at all uh, and just leaving dead air and let the music do it. All of these tools that we have for square dancing, we've talked about programming. Uh, Betsy, I think you're here with us today somewhere. Yeah. Betsy's given some excellent sessions on programming, also new dancers, also on timing and delivery. Uh, and all of these, Betsy doesn't use a lot of filler, but she does use filler to enhance the social impact or actually have a joke with people on the big movements, the right and left grand and things like that. But she doesn't use a lot of filler, but she does use a lot of directional prompts to newer dancers or to somebody that's struggling. And it, she's got this knack there where she can say, um, swing through and boys run to the right, Ferris wheel. And when you're in the middle, do this, this, this. And she'll direct you through what she wants to do and nobody will hear it except the person that actually needs the help. It just seems to come out that way that she's having a conversation with each individual uniquely on the floor. I have no idea how the hell she does it, but it, it's just one of those skills that she's developed over time. She feels like she's talking to you directly, giving you that little help that you need right now. And, you know, hopefully eventually we'll all develop these skills. And if she could ever, you know, market that in a little drinking bottle, it would be great. She'd make a fortune. All of these tools that we have tie together. No tool will work individually. You cannot build a house with a hammer, but you cannot build a house without a hammer. And that's the way you got to approach square dancing. You cannot call a square dance by knowing the definitions, but you cannot call a square dance without knowing the definitions. You cannot call a square dance without knowing timing. You cannot call a square dance with timing and not knowing everything else. They all work together and you've gotta be able to use them all together or it just doesn't work. And this is just another tool. Use it properly and you'll be fine. Any other comments, questions? Bill, yes. I just wanna say something you mentioned earlier as far as uh, learning your own uh, style and you know, don't try to copy uh, other callers. I, um, when back when I took my lessons to call in 1981, there was a caller in Sacramento when I was still living there and Bob Elling is on, he'll know the name. His name was Roger Morris, tall, lanky dude that, uh, but every periodically he would put a square dance callers class on and he only had less, no less than six, no more than 10. And, uh, he taught us the basic fundamentals, but in the beginning, you know, new callers, you know, we didn't have a style. So we usually tended to lean toward the closest thing. And uh, uh, Roger had a unique, a unique and fun style. And I, I used it a, a bit, well, quite a bit when I first started. But then as things progressed, you, you learn to develop your own style. Uh, so uh, I agree. Don't don't use another caller. You know, com, uh, any callers try to copycat them. Use them to assist you until you develop your own style. Yeah, I have no problem mimicking another caller. I I, I do it incessantly. I'm I'm a blatant plagiarist. I am a blatant thief when it comes, sorry, I, I do not steal choreography. I blatantly research other people's choreography <laughs> into my repertoire, uh, which is the polite way of saying, yes, I actively steal other people's choreography when I think it's good. 
and all callers should do it. I encourage you to do it. But what you're saying, Bill, is absolutely correct. There's nothing wrong with taking the good points and the influence of any caller and adding that to your own toolbox to help you develop your own style. That's why I use the, um, the analogy of Millet and Gauguin to, as influences for Van Gogh. Van Gogh is a unique painter. Gauguin worth a hell of a lot more money. I, I don't think he's half the painter that Van Gogh was. But Millet influenced both of them. One that's almost not known. He influenced the market for painting. He influenced how painting was uh, distributed, art, artworks and showmanship, great works of art, a masterful painter. And yet very people even know about him. Yet he's the one that got most of these guys started and set the template for all of these guys to develop their own skills. That's what every caller should strive to achieve as a caller. Be the best that you can be, develop your own unique style. And if you can pass that information on and help influence somebody to develop their own style, even if they become phenomenally better than you or worth more money than you, <coughs> that's good because that's something that you can take pride in having done. Yes, Betsy. I can't, I can't bottle everything that you say I did, but one, one hint I, I can give is that if you develop the ability as a caller to either learn how you're maneuvering dancers or be confident in that so that you don't have to stare at your sight square to the exclusion of all others, you can watch the whole floor and you can analyze the, the sequences that you're calling so you kind of have a sense of what's going to give the average dancer trouble. You can give them the hint that they need by either by seeing a break in the pattern on the rest of the floor or because you know that they're going to be afraid to do what you think they're, they, what they think you should just said because it's not what they're used to. So if, if I say blah, 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 and now so-and-so is in the middle, it's because I know that so-and-so wasn't feeling secure because they were going into the middle because it wasn't what they were thought they should be doing. Absolutely. What, what I've always liked is even if you don't give a name, it always seems like you're having a private conversation with every single individual privately and nobody else seems to know. And one day I'll get that. Michael, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I just had uh, another thing I'd like to mention. If you always got to be careful and check um, what you're doing, because sometimes you, it gets so automatically with the call and it gets a habit. And like on the swing through example, you had um, turn half by the right and centers turn half by the left. You got to yep. be careful if you started from a left hand ocean wave. The left turn is not in the center. So yep. that really is a tough part where you really have to be sure whether it's it comes across the right way right absolutely this this is what i was talking about when i mentioned habit crutches and thank you very much excellent point and a perfect example we we all hear bend the line go up to the middle and back that's a habit crutch that a lot of callers have and they don't even think of it as a movement but swing through half right half left is also a habit crutch or right and left and if you do something like Dixie style to an ocean wave, swing through, go right and left, you're going to be correct. But I've heard a lot of callers say outsides half, centers half. Because that's the only way they call it. We, we right. hear um, recycle, boys cross fold, girls will follow. Well, what if you're in a left hand wave with the girls on the outside? If you've got that as a habit, you're going to give the wrong directional prompts and then the dancers are going to get confused and it becomes even worse because in English, the dancers, if they, if they know the movement, will dance the movement. But if you're in a different culture with a different language, your directional prompts are going to confuse the hell out of the dancers. If you're in a left hand wave, if you're in a left hand wave and you say swing through right and left, absolutely no problem with that. But if you're used to saying outsides insides, which some people do, then you've got a big problem. Yeah. I could even I could even say that just uh, swing through half by the right half by the left would yield two swing throughs over here. Yeah, because you're swing. actually giving the. <laughs> yeah. Now swing through is one of those commands. It's absolutely correct. 
half right, half left. But if it's a habit and you mm -hmm. want to do a left swing through and you say, do a left swing through half by the right and half by the left because you're so used to saying it. Now you, you start to confuse people because you're telling them to do two different things. And I believe that's what you're saying, isn't it, Michael? Yes. Oh, yeah. Even more so, it's it's too much information occasionally because if you say swing through, turn half by the right, turn half by the left, you have actually called two swing throughs. Yep. <laughs> yeah, the other thing was, for example, on a spin chain through, if you start by the right and then go left three quarters, what about if a left handed ocean wave? So yeah. you got to be careful of the arrangement as well. Yeah. Yeah? Or if and you say boys in the middle go three quarters, whatever. If, if you have a one or two arrangement, um, it doesn't work. Yeah, and th this is where the difference is. Your directional prompts are there as an indication for the dancers. And what Betsy was saying was, instead of watching one square, watch the floor and see, because your one square may have easily made a mistake as well. Watch the floor to see what they're doing. And if you do need to give a directional prompt, it has to be that. It's a directional prompt to assist the dancers. It's not a crutch habit of expression and we all develop expression habits and that's what we as callers need to break filler word is there for a reason it's to assist to help with the timing it's to assist to help with the flow it's to assist to help with the rhythm filler directional words are there to assist the dancers to know where they want to go with the right timing of where they want to go and they're two completely different techniques uh, filler word for the sake of rhyming filler is a technique to fill in that dead air and add or enhance the flavor of the song. Filler words as a directional prompt have to be accurate. They have to be correct. They have to be timed correctly. And if you start mixing the two, this is where problems occur and it's not taught. And this is what Yolanda was uh, telling me about last week, I believe. You're, you're taught filler words and how to say them, but you're not taught why or what it's about and how to use them. Would that be a, a correct analogy, Yolanda? Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've heard a lot of very, frustration, very frustrated expressions from newer callers that are taught to use these filler words and they're taught to say, swing through two by two. Uh, do the right and left through and turn that girl. And then suddenly you call, you know, they start calling it plus and they say right and left through and turn that girl. And for some silly, stupid, absolutely wrong reason and it should never be called, they're calling right and left through half sashayed. But that's just my personal opinion. <laughs> I hate, I hate a half, a half sashayed right and left through. It's always and always will be a gimmick to me, but that's just me. I'll leave it at that one. <laughs> but you understand what I mean about the gimmick or about the prompting. If you've got a habit, you could be giving contrary commands. Alan, you had your hand up. Uh, I just wanted to make a comment in particular with newer callers. The thing that uh, often you hear them do is that they get their filler words off the beat. So yeah. they don't carry the rhythm with their filler words. That's the first thing. And uh, if the command is swing through, when you do a left swing through, you've now got three words. So you probably need to uh, leave more time before you the call and trying to say right and left through in two beats or whatever your call is, you've got to figure out how much time you need to use that and keep it on the rhythm. As well as if you suddenly start choosing your own filler words, if they if they don't just fit and you're squeezing them in, then nothing destroys it, the rhythm more than that, yes. A classic example on that is uh, if we look at eight chain four, okay? How many beats does it take to say eight chain four? Two. How many beats does it take to say square through? Two. Spin chain through. You can say that in two or three. Spin chain and exchange the gears. You try and say that in two and your dancers are going to lose it. Spin chain and exchange gears. It just doesn't work. Okay. So if you're going to, if you're one of those people that uses filler words, then You've got to practice your filler words for different types of movements. And this is what I mean is practice your spontaneity. I may call heads square through, spin chain and exchange the gears. 
Okay, if I'm going to use filler words, I'm going to go head square through and I get four hands around you do and when you're there spin chain and exchange the gears, it's just not going to work. I might go head square through four hands around spin chain and exchange the gears. I'm backing it up so that they're getting the command on the sixth beat instead of the eighth beat, the start of it, and they know where they're going. Most of your spin chains all start the same way. I could get away with it, but what's gonna happen in the center? You can still do it on the eight, but your delivery timing has to be practiced. As uh, Alan was saying, left swing through. If you wanna give that directional prompt and then add it in hand, it says square through four hands, or sorry, left square through four hands, left swing through, you might want to go, set, that would be fine, but if I go centers pass through, left swing through, I've got to give that extra beat in there so that they know they have to step to a left hand wave to do the swing through. And if I want to do step to a left hand wave, swing through, center start, I have to give even more time. So I've got to adjust my filler. And you have to learn to practice those things beforehand with different commands coming in or ideally learn how long it takes to set those up and not use any filler until you're comfortable. Filler is just that, fills, and it should be there for a purpose. In, to, in modern square dancing, there's not a lot of filler because the timing is so awkward to fill in. True masters like Eric can do that. I can't. So I try to minimize the amount of filler I use, but I still use an awful lot. And I have habit crutches. I'm not going to deny it. I do have habit crutches that I'm trying to break still. And I've only been doing this for 40 years. It takes time. It takes twice to build a habit. It takes about 280 times to break that habit. And as soon as you mess up, you got to start breaking it again. So be aware of that. Develop your techniques without the filler to get your timing and then use your filler to bring in. That's different than your directional prompts. Your directional prompts have to be timed properly. And as both Guido and, and Guga have pointed out, directional prompts need to be timed accurately with the beat of the music so that you can get it for the dancers to dance smoothly. Yes, Betsy. Two things, going back to what Mike, the example Michael used a while ago about Dixie style to a wave, and then so it's a left-handed wave, so the swing through would start in the middle. My analysis of this, for at least for dancers in the state, would be to say, boy, start, swing through. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't say right and left at all. I would say, boy, start, and then it would flow for them because they would be uncomfortable. And my other comment, has nothing to do with filler words. It has to do with practicing. If you're a newer caller and you want to practice, at least if you're not an English speaking, you know, a, a, a native English -speaking caller, the, the people in other countries, I'm not sure whether you want to practice this in English or not. But if you're a uh, if you native English speaker, if you want to practice delivering things with the music first, practice on like nursery rhymes or something, something, some sort of poetry or song lyrics and chant them to get them to, because uh, what I find is that callers will start practicing delivering calls and they'll start thinking about how it works. And that oh, yeah, will interrupt absolutely. their practice. So if I, if I say, Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go, and I'm not going to do any more of that. But that So that, it followed her to school one day. <laughs> <laughs> it was against the rules. Yes, but the point, the point is, that's how you can practice just chanting with the music without thinking about the choreography. And then you practice how to deliver things in two beats, and then you're comfortable working with the music. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I like your lorem ipsum for Squadron's callers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could, oh, one more point in, in my caller stool. We have something which is, um, before the art, you must master the craft. And the craft is moving the dancers around. And there are certain rules we have to stick. And the craft, it's either right or wrong. Either you are in timing or you're not in timing. So adding the filler words, I would put that into the art. 
Now, there's Absolutely. nothing wrong uh, with art. It's only dislike or like. Yeah, but before you go into the art, you must master the craft. You're ab absolutely correct. When when you start looking at um, square dancing as a whole, the tools of square dancing. That this was a discussion that was actually came up recently. Somebody made a comment about. Uh, once you have your core principles down, you should be able to apply square dance to any program and call any program. It's just a matter of adding new movements. I disagree with that very strongly because nobody takes the time to define what are core skills. You know, is is choreography a core skill? Yes, but nobody defines what is choreography. Okay. Choreography is definitions because you need to know that or you don't know choreography. Choreography is timing. And that's all three aspects of timing. Choreography is pattern flow and traffic flow. It's handedness, it's kinesiology. It's the whole dance matrix. It's also the timing of flow sequencing. It's the timing of sequences and length and duration of sequence. All that's choreography. And that seems to be what everybody focuses on. And choreography is actually one very small part of what it takes to be a square dance caller, moving the dancers around. That's what we do. Anybody can move the dancers around. Anybody, even if you're not a caller, can get up there, read the definitions, understand the principles, and say, head square through four hands, watch the dancers when they're done. Okay, they stop, good, uh, do the right and left through because they understand that. That doesn't make them a caller because there's so much more that goes into it. And and I kid you not, we've had a lot of people that do that. We've, we've got a lot of singing calls that were produced for a while where you've got professional singers that produce these, these music and they're beautiful, beautiful works of art, but you can tell they're not callers because of the way the song is delivered. And yet they can do it. It's timed perfectly. It's just how these words are said. So enunciation, pronunciation, showmanship, delivery, all of these skills go into. Sight resolution is an important square dance caller skill, but it's a very, very small skill and it's very low on the totem priority. Sight calling, is a very low priority skill. You don't need to be a sight caller, but it's a very handy skill and it's a useful tool. And as Michael's saying, all of these things go well into learning all of these core foundation skills. Filler words and timing are core foundation skills, but they're not important skills. You don't need to know them to be a caller, but they are tools that can assist you be a better caller. But if not taught correctly and not taught properly will assist you in being a horrifically bad caller with poor timing. And think of it in exactly the same way. I'm going to use your, uh, expand on your analogy a bit more, Michael. If you are taught as a caller, square through takes the dancers, head square through takes the dancers from a static square and puts them to a corner box. So you now you've learned formations, formation recognition, management, and you've learned the ability to move the dancer. So let's say you have all of that, but you haven't learned delivery timing. You've learned timing of movements. Square through takes 12 beats. So you call head square through and then you count to 12. And then you do the right and left through. You can move the dancers around. That's a core foundation fundamental skill that every caller has to have. But you will never be a caller unless you can fill those things in, unless you can realize the different aspects of timing, know when to give the next command. That's another core skill. Until you can realize how long it takes to deliver, how long it takes to execute, and how long it takes to prepare, that's another core skill. All of those things have to work together. And all of the tools in your toolbox will work together. But I stress, and, and um, just to put it into perspective, you have a lot of tools in your toolbox. You do not need to use all the tools to build something. You do not need to use all the tools to call a square dance. But if you know how to use the tools you have correctly, you can do a phenomenal job with just a few tools, or you can do a phenomenal job with more tools, or you can do an absolutely horrific job using all of the tools incorrectly. Uh, Michael, excellent comment. Thank you. The floor is open for discussion. It, it is a, uh, a difficult topic, 
but um, one of the things that you, you, like Betsy said, use nursery rhymes and things like that for um, practicing most, because most nursery rhymes are in couplets. They're designed to be that way. Uh, another good thing is Dr. Seuss, uh, you know, Dr. Seuss is absolutely bizarre if you want to try and call square dancing with it. Um, you know, if square through four, you know, I don't like green eggs and ham, green eggs and ham, and yes, I am, you know, and whatever, whatever you want to do, it makes absolutely no sense. Or you can just do all sorts of weird and wonderful things, but I can guarantee you that any caller that does this has practiced this. If I'm going to say, uh, head square through four, and then I walked downtown and I had a biscuit, do si do. It had jam and cheese, swing through, boys run to the right and Ferris wheel. After that, I went to the toilet. You know, it'll all fit. It'll make no sense. I guarantee your dancers will listen to you. And you can tell these little stories. I wouldn't tell that story, but you know, you can tell these little stories and the dancers will tune in memorably. Don Beck is a master of doing this. Okay. He did this so often. He just tell this story. Um, Randy Doherty was another one. He'd just tell a story in the middle of his patter and you'd actually have to, you're dancing and you don't even realize your dancing is smo so smooth and so comfortable because you're so focused on the story he's telling that you, you're not even thinking about the dance anymore. That's a skill, but it's a very well-practiced skill and it goes in with the timing. Do that wrong. And as Michael says, if you, if you do it wrong, you're going to kill yourself before you start. Well, I've got a story about the storytelling. Go ahead. I had a singing call. It was a real love song. I think it was, uh, I missed the blue or whatever, uh, a long time ago. And I just sang it and called it, you know, like a regular singing call. And then after the middle break, I would start like, you know, honey, did you remember about the square through four? And then we did that dosey do. -si -do. And mm -hmm. after the third or fourth call, everybody was just standing there and listening to the story. And I said, what are you doing? This is supposed to dance. Nobody would dance anymore. They would just stay there and listen to what mm -hmm. you were telling. So yeah. <laughs> it was an entertaining was, tool. But <laughs> yeah. I was talking earlier. I did the song um, God Bless America again when I was in Montana. I actually had a whole floor stop on a singing call just to listen to the lyrics of the song. First time it ever happened to me, it, it freaked me out because I thought, oh, I thought maybe I called something. I thought they understood how to do grand spin, but yeah, they did. They just wanted to hear the song. It, it, it's a, it's a horrible cold feeling when it happens, but it's a wonderful <laughs> feeling when it happens at the same time. Cause you, you, you're yeah. not sure why. Right. Right. Hello, no, Key. We'll how are things in New Zealand? You're on mute, Key. You're muted. You've got to unmute your microphone. Little microphone. There you go. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, hello, Mel. Seeing you, uh, the sort of uh, in person, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I like all the exercises that you set for me. My pleasure. It's all good. Like, when do you do, you know, uh, half the same? <laughs> mm. <laughs> so, now, Australia and New Zealand, we opened the border. We are the lucky ones. Yeah, so far. A few, a few <laughs> places are open up, but, the, you know, a lot of places in Asia and the Middle East are still not open to us yet. So, no, they, we'll they, see they, what happens. Yeah. So, well, they uh, are coming here for us, our skiing. Chris, you had a question. Uh, uh, well, two things. Um, uh, first, uh, I have uh, uh, a uh, a video of uh, something I want to show, but not until the very very bitter end. Um, but the but I had a question meantime, which was um, uh, callers in uh, countries outside the United States uh, that are that don't speak uh, you know English natively, do they when they're calling at least at home? Do they throw in patter in their own language, or is does everybody just try to do English patter? Um, I'm, before I let others address that, I, I did mention briefly, I, I've called in Germany, I've called in, in Switzerland, in Sweden, in France, 
uh, pretty much around the world. I have heard callers call in English. I've heard uh, German callers use English patter. I've heard German callers use German patter. I've heard Japanese callers use Japanese patter filler or even call in Japanese. The square dance words are in English. How they do it, I have absolutely no idea. And I know it works one way, but it doesn't really work the other way sometimes. Um, but I, we've got a lot of non-native English speakers here. So uh, let's get some of them to fill in their experiences. Yeah, I, I, I know what I do. I, I try to speak the filler words in Swedish or some kind of Swinglish or mixed, just to make sure that the dancers realize what is the actual commands and what is just uh, the gibberish around it. it is, is Swinglish something like, um, what do you call it? Yeah. Frang, Franglais? It makes them. <laughs> Every hoop and uh, yeah, yes. I, lo I love make, it. Just make sure that Swing no one misunderstand me for uh, a square dance call. <laughs> What's your experience in Germany, Guido? Michael? The, the, sa the same thing. Um, there is stuff we do in English, and there is. Um, Pattern filler explanations, clarifying um, words that we do in German because it's easier for the dancers to understand. And as Guga said, uh, or you said, right and left through, right pull by courtesy turn is two calls. Yeah. Well, it's actually three calls. Three. Yeah. Um, and um, if if I would say, I would say the right uh, right pull by courtesy turn. Um, I would use German helping there to pro to prevent the dancers from doing the, uh, prevent at least some dancers from doing the call twice. Yeah, and that that's actually a very important consideration because there's there's a habit, and it used to be very prevalent of hash calling was not just a long stream of choreography on tempo and on beat hash calling for some reason at one point became dancing at 132 plus beats per minute with stacked calls so you get a right and left through and pass through and bend the line and a right and left through and star through and dive through centers pass through do it oh side oh and then the caller would wait for you to catch up to them that's not what hash calling is but for a while that that became a problem and when you have things as guido says do the right and left through give a right pull by and turn that girl I think that's what okay. uh, now I've now I've done three different calls and it's very different to say right and left through give a right pull by and courtesy turn as it is to say do the right and left through and turn that girl. They're I very the, distinct differences. Go ahead, Chris. I was going to say the the fast stuff uh, might be what I uh, heard some people call hot hash um, was a term that um, hmm. that I heard. Yeah, hash calling is just non sequential choreography without a rhyme or a reason. It's, it's stuff that you just make up. Essentially, hot hash is you don't have any of the breaks, such as the Alaman left, et cetera. It's just a bang, 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 you're home, you're into, you know, slide through your home, side, square through four, and you get four hands around, you go swing through, boys run to the right, you do in Ferris wheel, star through, head square through, in, and that's your hot hash. It's, it's a continuous se sequence. It is usually of a little bit faster pace, but it's yeah, not but it's not designed to be a hundred calls stacked one on the other and you have to right. think five movements ahead. Unfortunately, a lot of callers think the faster you call, the better it is. And it's not. No. It's worse for the dancers. Yeah, I I guess the I had learned the word uh hash as just a synonym for patter and hot hash was patter where you're giving no where your timing is uh very precise with no extra catch up uh, you know. No extra, yeah. no extra beats inserted uh, for catching up. They got to be totally, you know, right, right with it at all times. Yeah, all. and if I may step in here, Perfect. no dosi dos, no bend the line or up to the middle and back to catch up, and as if possible, then only calls which go for two beats, like star through, pass through, trade by whatever, bam, 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 and no big long calls where you can catch up. So this is what, what the hot hash. And a lot of callers mix that up 
with Colin as fast as possible and, and have command stacking. And, and that's not hard hash. Uh, yeah. But you, you absolutely, and you're right, Chris, hash calling is a synonym for pattern calling. You've got yeah. the hoedown, you've got hash, and you've got pattern calling. All three of them are essentially the same. Um, different calling styles have developed, especially in the last 20 years, where the idea of a do si do to an ocean wave swing through, which was a perfect, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with it, to, oh, it's an absolute aberration. Don't call a do si do unless you need to. Well, I, I personally think that's crap. Uh, sorry to be so blunt. If you want to call a do si do and you need to call a do si do, use it. I believe in using a do si do when it's necessary. I don't believe in using a do si do when it's not necessary, but there's nothing wrong with using it if I'm using it for a purpose. Hash calling was, you had, sorry, you had patter calling, which was, for instance, head square through four, do a do si do, swing through, boys run to the right, bend the line and a right and left through, flutter wheel, slide through, alaman left. Okay, I'm calling patter calling, which is modular sequencing resolving to a corner, or I'm calling memorized routines. Hash calling with the came to the fore with more the development of site calling, which was an extemporaneous setup. But you still had your dos i dos, you still had your forward and back, you allowed the dancers to catch up and dance comfortably. Hot hash then said, let's take all of the fluff and filler out of there. A lot of resolves to home. Well, now that seems to be a calling style. Everyone wants to resolve to home for the big wow. Well, I can tell you right now as a dancer, and many dancers will tell you this, if everything you do is a resolve to home, dancers don't like it. If everything you do is that surprise get out, dancers don't like it. It's not a surprise anymore. If you'd get no chance or no reward for the Alaman left and the right and left grand, dancers don't like it. It's not rewarding. And that, that's talking basic mainstream and most plus because they need to feel the reward. When you get an advance and challenge, it doesn't matter. To me, it matters, but most, most challenge dancers will tell you they're there for the, the mechanical thought process. Everything should resolve to home and you shouldn't stop. Okay, if that's what they like, that's what they like. But that seems to have come down as the lack of calling has developed to easier dancing for basic dancers instead of a full program dancing. And a lot of advanced and challenge callers trying to force advanced and challenged movements into the basic and mainstream program. Well, I, I don't, I don't know. That, I, I don't know. Hang on, this hang on, Chris, hang on. This, this, this is where I see it. And now hot hash became no filler, but that's also developed into a calling style. Everybody wants to resolve the home. I, I personally, I, I like resolves to home, but I'll, I'll I may, may do one or two in a tip or maybe even three or four in a night because I like to maintain the surprise and I like to reward the dancers. But each caller knows their dancers and each caller has to make that judgment for their dancers to give their audience what they want. And if your dancers like that, give them what they want because that's what this is about. Go ahead, I don't Chris. think that the uh, I don't think that the resolve the home thing came from challenge. I noticed it at lower levels from there. I think it was just a few festival callers thought it was a uh, thought it was a wow thing to do and that other uh, callers saw that and, and wanted to copy mm. it. At, now at challenge, I would never call Alaman left. Uh, right and left grand promenade home. I would just call uh, Alaman left prom uh, Alaman left promenade, or you know, or right Alaman into a right and left home. grand with no Alaman, and yeah. hopefully the right and left grand ending. In other words, not too many of them, but it, but uh, yeah. just uh, your home, uh, in in my view, was always just a novelty that yeah. uh, was not really that wouldn't be the normal way of resolving a challenge. Uh, and I, it, I it seems to be, and I think I think you're absolutely correct, and that's what I was saying with the the result. That's the surprise get up. You're home. Oh, surprise! Oh, wow! How did we get here? You know that that is that. But everybody strove to get that, and then it became the norm, and the yeah. surprise became the new normal. And when normal be, when surprise becomes normal, normal is not a surprise. Yeah, but I saw that at at, at uh, regular at basic at mainstream. Thing. Absolutely. Before I saw it people doing it a challenge. Now yeah. people do it, it's, it's a thing to do. Yeah, That's and I, I personally think it's an overused thing. Oh. Uh, go ahead, Betsy. I know you, I could see your face cringe there for something, so. Yeah, uh, part, of, part of the reason if I'm calling advanced challenge, 
part of the reason I'm going to resolve at home is because I get really irritated when I call calls and they don't do them. Yeah. And if if I call Alaman left and they play patty cake, it makes me yeah. it makes me testy, and that's not good for the dancers. Therefore, I will resolve at home or do right and left grand resolves or something else. One one of the um, absolutely, and it's usually if. Advanced challenge dancers that come and dance plus, or experienced plus dancers, not the not the new crop of plus dancers or the the pseudo plus, uh, which happens. The the what I call pseudo plus is hi, I'm a brand new dancer. Great, in twelve weeks you're now a member of the plus club. Those are the pseudo plus dancers because they still got another six years to learn the rest of basic and mainstream. But I, I remember what a lot of hang, hang on, Chris. What a lot of a lot of those callers do is they set up intentionally their resolutions so that every dancer is in the right-hand quadrant for the, either the right and left grand or the, or the promenade so that they have to do at least a one quarter promenade or they have to do a promenade because they can't unpromenade because it just feels wrong. <laughs> I, I remember when people did not do the, the stupid uh, patty cake uh, Alaman left and and mm -hmm. I, uh, as a dancer, always hated it. If somebody stuck their hand out, tried to do that to me, I would generally be obnoxious and grab their arm and forcibly alamand them. <laughs> but um, the uh, um, that's uh, you know that's just some people started that and whatever. I mean that wasn't a normal part of challenge dancing for at least no. the longest time. One of the things that got me was the hand slap star through. Yeah, same. Well, that, yeah. <laughs> I said, if you want to dance, dance. Ed, you had your hand up. Yes. Um, I, I know from experience or some um, dancers that just get tired of too many of the right and left grands and the weave mm -hmm. the rings and will complain about that. And I, I think that's, um, and, and then the, the longer promenades, if you've been going a while, is one reason why, uh, as Betsy says, they won't do the full promenade they'll do the backup promenade or or things like that and i i do have a, a difference of opinion i guess on on this that your rewards are are the right and left grand um i think there are other things that can happen um but as as you've been dancing longer some people do get tired of the road and some of that is the it's just the problems of the callers won't vary their style. Yeah, this that's excellent points. All of them excellent points. And that's two of the core skills that need also to be taught and stressed. One is judgment. And the second one is variety. If you call anything the same all the time, and let's use Alaman left, right and left grand, swing your partner promenade. How many people set that up, you know, square through four, there it is, do si do, eight chain four, oh, I'm halfway around, Alaman left, right and left, grand, ah, swing your partner, promenade, I'm doing it from home or I'm doing it from that quadrant where I have to do a full promenade. We had a session here with Kip about how to use those rotates, how to use those inverts to set them up to move the dancers. So that way you can do things like, uh, as Chris said, instead of Alaman left, Oh, great. Swing through boys trade, right and left grand. You know, how you want to do that so that your right and left grand ends you at home or ends you with a two-step promenade and, or, you know, swing your home, clap, 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 or whatever you want to do or slide, or meet your partner, star through California twirl and your home. There's, it's not so much as a surprise because you've had the right and left grand. You know where you're going to end up. You're there. But if you are going to use a right and left grand, you should make sure that you're never more than halfway away from home for the promenade, especially in a pattern. But you do need to add variety, as you're saying, Ed. You need Not everything should be Alamand left, right and left grand in a full promenade. Not everything should be right and left grand, your home. Not everything should be Ferris wheel slide, your, your home. Clap, clap, clap. You need to mix and match and find that. And that's judgment. And I just like to add on to that while we're onto it. If you do a lot of promenades, in your patter, and there's nothing wrong with it, you don't want to start your singing call with every figure having a promenade. If you, every singing call you have has a promenade at the end, and the next figure starts with heads promenade halfway, 
you've got promenade 16 beats, promenade eight beats, promenade 16 beats, promenade eight beats, promenade 16 beats, promenade eight beats. You've used up one third of your singing call just doing promenades. So just, just remember that. That's where variety and styling comes in. And that's where judgment comes in. And these are things that are, have been left out of the teaching curriculum for callers for a long time. Chris, excellent topic. And thank you very much for, for, for pointing out. Ed, excellent points. Um, you ask about uh, filling and, and uh, how we do that in Germany as well. Yeah. As non-speaker, I've got two examples I, I've been using. I've been waiting for somebody the, to do that. Um, that is um, uh, a singing call, um, I Don't Want to Miss a Thing, mm -hmm. which is the theme song of the movie Armageddon. If you know that with Bruce Willis, yep. where something yep. is hitting towards the earth. And they're, they're oil drillers and they send them up there. Yeah. Yeah. So I tell the whole story with the song, with the daughter and with um, MJ, I think is his name, uh, when they get together while calling the whole uh, song. And that's when I use very simple choreo. And of course, I tell the story in German. So they yep. can follow the movie. And the week later, everybody went to the movie. <laughs> and, um, and we had another movie which was um, a kind of a western type thing which was uh, kind of funny type thing like there was one in there he was talking oh, like this okay a mom and that yeah, right and I would kind of um, persiflash that with, with you know you got the boys in the middle and swing through ah oh, how nice I would like to be with the boys in there in the middle and stuff like that and everybody would go to that <laughs> movie so I, if I get some percentage um, uh, Guido knows the one. It's the most famous movie in, in Germany and the most successful. The shoot is money too. And um, so this is kind of was brand new and I fit that in, into the pattern and, and just goofed around. Kept them flowing. It was easy and nice moving and, and had that attitude in there. And mm -hmm. uh, seen other callers do it as well afterwards then. And so this is something where you have filler as an entertaining tool, but uh, I Absolutely. wouldn't know to do it. So yeah. I, I'd like, like to point out, Roz Turnbull made a comment in the chat. Um, she said, uh, I've changed the words to a song to meet the theme very, very much like what you're talking about, not just filler words. Um, John advised me to keep the choreography easy as the dancers are concentrating on what you're saying and not the choreography. And it's a very valid point. And it goes very much with what you're saying, uh, Michael. If you are going to play with the words or play with the lyrics, and that's going to be the draw of your theme, uh, or you're doing a horror movie, Vincent Price, and you got the evil laugh and all these other kinds of things, this is what's going to draw the dancers into that memory, not your choreography. So you want to make sure that if you're going to start doing that, or if you're going to tell a story with your patter filler, or if you're going to do something along that line, that you change your choreography to make it so that that's the draw. It's got to be smooth. It's got to be danceable. It's got to feel just that little bit different or that little bit comfort or that little bit of relaxation. But the draw is what you're doing with the words, with the filler, especially if you're changing the lyrics to a song or adding. By contrast, if your filler is going to be directional prompts, you want to reserve that for when you're doing difficult movements or you're going to try and make an easy movement seem difficult intentionally give that feeling of false success. So again, this is where judgment, a skill that is not taught very well, needs to come into play. And that's one of the most important tools in your toolbox. Yes, Betsy. Another thing is if you have a piece of music that's more modern, and maybe it has some background vocals, that's another time when you want to back off of the of the complexity of your choreography and use, because the dancers are gonna be into listening to the music and they're not gonna be fo focused on the dance puzzle. Mm -hmm. So um, that's another time when you wanna change how, how you deliver or what you're delivering because of the nature of the music. It has Absolutely. nothing to do with filler words, but it's just along those lines. And there was, there was something else I was trying to think that I had in my head and I've lost it. So I'll be back. Um, yeah, Yolanda, have... sorry, Yolanda, what's that singing call that uh, you were doing for me the other day? 
It's a riverboat. There is a time. Was it that one? That's the one. Okay. okay. Um, a very, very good example on that. Um, Yolanda was doing it. Now, Yolanda's a new caller. Phenom she does a phenomenal job at this record, but it's one of those ones that it, you can really differentiate between the movement, the delivery of the movement, and then there's lyrics between them, head square through lyrics of the song, you know, the grand square, lyrics of the song. If you have the ability to do that with records and you've got a really, really good piece of music and very much like what Betsy is saying, it's not just necessarily if it has background vocals, you can be those background, you know, and you'll hear some really great callers develop that skill. Like I'll head square through and they'll start singing the lyrics of the song, you know, head square through. I, I had a secret chord round that corner, do side do, swing through and then, you know, uh, Tony Oxendine does that one on um, Ag Agio, I believe it is. So all, is that the one it's on? I think so. Anyway, um, if you've got the ability to do that and it fits the lyrics and the music and the metering of the song, don't shy away from it. Your singing call is your delivery and filler is important on that. Mike Sikorsky does a lot of filler on his singing calls, very little in his pattern. So filler is there with a purpose and they all do it with a purpose. Just make sure you're doing it for the right purpose to achieve the right goal. I, I cannot stress that enough. Yeah. And if you do so, then you really have to practice. There is one thing which I, I've been practicing over and over and, and years ago is a head square through in the middle and you muddle in the middle and the tune of the fiddle in the corner by the hall and whatever. And I've heard a lot of caller just go square through in the middle, 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 little, 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 and just with a little, 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 and they get off beat and it just, to me, it sounds terrible and it's just <laughs> kind of faking it. Okay. So what, when I did it, it is really listen to it. it. It does make sense. And then you have to build it up slowly, like first train it very slowly and then get fast and fast and then fit it to the rhythm. And when it does not fit, leave it out. So this is very important. Yeah. You have to train, train, train and exercise. Yeah. One of the other things, um, and I'm going to tie what you just said with what <clears throat> Betsy said, know your music and know what you're doing. Okay. If you have a really, really, I'm, I'm just going to play something here for a second and I want you to listen to this. So bear with me for one second. It's a piece of pattern music. Uh, if I can find it, of course, everything is exactly where you want it until you go to use it. Uh, come on, where are you? This is very embarrassing, people. I'll type it in. Okay, here we go. Listen, listen to this if you can hear it. Now, most of you can recognize that. It's Beethoven's fifth, of course, and it's a nice piece of pattern music. Now, what doesn't fit with this? Now, what Michael was just saying doesn't fit with this at all. Head square through and muddle in the middle to the tune of the fiddle. There's no fiddle in that. <laughs> if you're going to use fiddle or filler words, and this is what we were talking about, rhyming couplets are themed to draw your crowd in. If I'm gonna say bum, 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 head square through, bum, 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 head square through and muddle in the middle to the tune of the fiddle rent. And you're gonna, what the heck is he doing? However, that that's common sense and logic. You can also put that on and say, bum, 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 head you square through and muddle in the middle to the tune of the fiddle and do it intentionally because it just is so abstract and doesn't fit it's going to sound horrifically funny and it'll work once. Do it but a second, there, do it a second there, time, it will not work. 
but in there they call the fiddle violins. No. No, not going to accept that. <laughs> Mel, on yes. the other hand, if, if I'm solo, I'm not allowed to use, um, I've got a girl, she's so tall, sleeps in the kitchen with her feet in the hall. Mm. Well, my wife always wants me to call solo, and usually it's so low that she can't hear me anymore. <laughs> now, come on, how many of you thought of that at the same time? I cannot be the only one that thought of that. No. <laughs> okay. So, ideally, hey, hey, now, now, can you sing far away? The farther, the better. Yeah, that's another one. Um, so no, it's on a hill far back, away. <laughs> getting back on topic, filler words are not killer words unless you use them improperly. Know what filler words are. Know what you're going to use and why you're going to use them. No filler word in square dancing to the gay should be used without a specific purpose and a specific reason to deliver that. A rhyming couplet, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it if it's for you. Make sure your timing filler is for the dancers. You may have learned it to help you with your timing, but if you're going to use timing filler, you're only going to be using it for the dancers. Once you don't need it anymore, wean off it. You have to wean them off it, but you have to wean off it yourself so that when you use it, you're using it for a purpose and a specific reason to achieve a specific goal. And if you can achieve that, you're fine. Yes, Betsy. Uh, I thought of the, one, the other thing I was saying, and then I can tie into what you just said. Um, the one, the one uh, filler that, we, that I know they used to teach people was swing through without a stop, spin the top. Yeah. And by the time you get without a stop out, it is too long and they do. Yeah. And when you're, when you're trying to wean yourself off of the filler words, count it out how many beats it took you to t say those filler words. And then if you're weaning yourself off, say swing through, right and uh, spin the top. So you count in between them to yourself. You do not yep. have to count out loud. Uh, but that's a one way to check your timing. Do yep. a right and left through. You know, blah, blah. And of course, you have to be prepared for the, with, the, with the next call in your head. One Thank of the things that I had to, and without a stop is one of those things that is metered specifically for the movement spin the top following the swing through. But if you're, if you're using it as a habit crutch and you don't understand that timing has to be perfect on that, swing through, there's no pause. If you put swing through without a stop, spin the top, it's not going to work because it, yeah, that, it, it creates people, that little chunk. People breathe in yeah. between. And now, if, without breathing, it works. With, it, with breathing, it doesn't. And if, if you want to use stuff like that, before you use stuff like that, get the record, I've Been Everywhere. And when you can sing that, all four verses, without taking a breath, then you can start using filler like that. Uh, thank, thank you, uh, uh, Mel. I have to go to eat my lunch now. It's one o'clock in New Zealand. <laughs> Thanks yeah, for coming well, in, Jay. Anytime. Yeah. I have... I, I have posted this session, the, the notes and the PowerPoint uh, in the chat. Uh, they're also going to be on the site. Uh, Mark is going to post them up there. Okay. Just, just, just remember when you're, you're doing all of these other kinds of things, use what you're going to use for a reason. It's just like, and that goes with almost every tool in the toolbox. Um, Daryl Clendenin said it in his sessions. Um, Kip Garvey said it, Tony Oxendine, everybody has said exactly the same thing, even though they were all talking about different subjects. If you're going to do something, make sure you do it for a purpose and you have to know and understand what that purpose is. If you're gonna use a module, it's for a purpose. If you're gonna use a movement to do a specific thing, it's done for a purpose to achieve a specific goal. And that's what your filler words need to be as well. And they do have to be practiced. You can't practice what filler you're going to use on a night, but you can practice what filler you're going to use in different combinations. So that things like without a stop, spin the top doesn't become a habit. It's a purpose. 
And how many of us have heard callers say, swing through without a stop, recycle. <laughs> or swing through without a stop, do the right and left through. You know, things like that, because that habit without a stop has become just that a habit. And all it does is it really, excuse the expression, but it pisses the dancers off. Yeah. If you set them up to expect something and you change Absolutely. it, yeah. it's something that you can do once as a joke. Yeah. But there are a lot of callers that want to try and fix bad habits. And it's not, it's a good idea to fix bad habits, but you've got to do it properly. You don't do it by humiliating your dancers. And of Hello, course, um, Mel, uh, can I ask the uh, final questions? Yes, uh, you know, the dancer in New Zealand, they don't really like dosy dose. So yep. for example, if you said heads lead to the right and you, the next move you want to do is girls trade. So do you say step to a wave or do you say dosy do to a wave? I will use both. Um, do si do is one of those movements. I don't mind a do si do. I, using a do si do as a habit, head square through, do a do si do, make a wave swing through. Okay, that becomes a habit of calling. I might say heads lead to the right, do a do si do. Step, no, you know, no, and then I, I wouldn't I'm, say, I'm I would thinking, have to I'm say, not thinking step about, wave. not but thinking I would, of swing too. No, but I, I would too. say, if I had said heads lead to the right, do a do si do, make a wave, spin the top. I've, a do si do to a wave, spin the top. I might say heads lead to the right, spin the top. Depends on what it is I want to achieve. I try not to overuse a do si do, and that's where the problem is. People overuse it, but I have oh, no problem okay. using it. Yeah. But um, I've got one point here. Since we're there, if you make a wave or a step to a wave or a do si do to a wave, then I do not like moves that start with everybody. Yep. So for instance, okay. if I, and that's yeah, exactly should, what I'm should saying. Do something different, like those I don't make a wave and swing through it, it's nonsense. Yep. It's not good in the timing. Dancers expect something different. Um, uh, I would rather go with centers do something or yep. if set up like circulates or whatever, that's okay. But if you want to do a swing through from there, don't call make a wave, but just call swing through. And it's I, I do have, I've got one disagreement with that, Michael. Yeah. Head square through, do a do side do, make a wave swing through, does not affect the timing if you give the dancers the time to do it. Yeah, but it's the, very uh, common in singing calls. But doing I, it, I doing like it as, it. hang on, but doing it as a habit in the patter call is the same as doing Alaman left, right and left grand full promenade in a patter call over and over and over again. This is where judgment comes in. Timing if, maybe. If, if you're going to do it, don't do it all the time, but I have no problem head square through, do a do si do, swing through, but I will just as easily call head square through, do a do si do, make a wave, center start left, swing through. I'm you know, with you. I, I'll do things like that. It's done yeah, for a okay. purpose. And this is what you have, and this is where judgment comes in. When you want to do something, do it all. Every movement you call should be done for a purpose. Key, I've danced in New Zealand, I've called in New Zealand, and you're absolutely right. I learned very quickly that I do a lot of dos I dos more than New Zealand callers do. And, and I pulled yeah. it out. I pulled because out the, all, the older one, dancers, one, they don't really like dos I do. Yep. What, one of my favorite combinations is uh, after, for instance, head square through, dos I do via left, mm -hmm. girls trade or something, just to make uh, people get into a nice uh, body flow for the uh, veer. And also teaching them not to do a hidey ho in the do so. Yeah. Yeah, Go call ahead, those I do and roll. Um, <laughs> Mel, Mel, there's one sort of filler word that you haven't talked about, and that's the impromptu ones where you maybe want to congratulate somebody on a recovery or a uh, they've got through a move or something like that. And that's a filler word. Is their filler words as well. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that, that falls in your absolute right. I should have mentioned that because it's also very important. Um, Don Beck talks about having conversations, or he has a lot of conversations with the dancers when he calls. And I've heard you do this as well, Alan. Um, they have conversations with the dancers. Betsy Gotta does that, has conversations with the dancers. 
But when somebody does something specifically good or is filled in something, it, it's a two-edged sword. Like let's say Betsy and Alan are dancing as a couple and they've had the most horrific time learning square through because Alan's always turning the wrong way and Betsy's trying to correct him rather than do her dance. So they finally get it. Now, Alan's a very shy person and very, he's got a, Betsy's got a very strong personality. So I'll say, way to go, Betsy, well done. So like, yeah, damn right, I got it. And, and Alan will say, don't, don't, don't point me out. I don't want anybody to look at me. I, 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 damn, you know, I may have got it right, but now everybody knows I've been doing it wrong. It's a two-edged sword, but don't be scared to give compliments, a simple, well done, you guys, or an acknowledgement. They'll, they'll know you're talking to them. If you know the people really well, and it's somebody that, you know, really likes that compliment or likes to hear their name on the mic in a positive way, don't hesitate to do it. Just make sure you know your audience. And it's a very, very valid point because callers we always say the reward is the Alaman left or the reward is the right and left grand. Guess what? Reward is acknowledgement. Good job as well. Don't hesitate to give that praise. Sometimes you don't even have to mention their name. You can just say, oh, great recovery out there. And, uh, right. and, and it, you get the same message across that, uh, yeah, you, you were hesitant about doing it, but you finally got it sort of thing. And, uh, could I pull the message back to um, return to home and yep. offer a thought that some people had may not have thought of, and that is if you've got singing calls that use promenades, then maybe you can consider uh, using a figure that gives you a return to home before the middle break or a figure that returns to home during for the last break even so that you use a figure for the last break of a singing call. Maybe people haven't, I've experimented with that. And sometimes when it's the right, the right tune or the right music, and that might be that particular return to home might be something you'd been using in your choreo, then that has a great effect as an ending sometimes to a singing call rather than just a swing at home. Yeah. I know a lot of callers at the A1, A2 and I don't know about challenge because I don't dance challenge. I don't even dance A2, but I've watched it. Uh, we'll use a return to home figure or just essentially a, a fifth figure as a middle break, uh, as, as a single. And they'll, they'll actually do an A1 figure or an A2 figure. That is their middle break. Again, it, it falls down to judgment. You know what your dancers like. Uh, Key said in New Zealand, they don't like a lot of dos I dos. Once you know that, Stop using the dose I dose. These, these are call, judgments that callers have to make. And it's one of the reasons why it's so important to wean off because a movement can be a filler for you as a caller and it can become a habit. Dose I do will always follow a square through. Spin the top will always follow a swing through. Right and left through will always follow a spin the top. Not because it always does. It's because you've developed that habit of calling it. It becomes predictable. So you have to wean yourself off of those the same as you do other dancers, other callers. Absolutely correct. And very good point, Al. I had a uh, conversation with Jeremy Story a couple of years back. Uh, we were on the way to the airport <laughs> uh, about uh, swing through because you're not a partner and you're not a couple. So for us, I said, when we go to do a swing through, I says, the way, the way I teach it is I come out and I teach them first is the, is the trade. Uh -huh. With, and then once they learn how to trade, trade by the right, now the center's trade. And then I just tell them to use your hands now and do a swing through. Trade, trade right, trade left. And it's, they, they stay there. If, they, if I don't do the trade, if I don't do the, uh, trade as a call first to teach them they end up wanting to, the ends one are waiting to swing to swing again rather than stop <laughs> so and the other thing with uh, Mike Sikorsky's course uh, which I've I've really studied and went through with uh, sometimes I'll use that as a finishing up at, and they'll end up at home which he does well just almost with his a lot of his calls and they, they're surprised, like how they how did I get here? You got them in a you got them in a right hand box. 
okay, center's face in and back out. And these are like, oh, rather than Alabama left, promenade. So yep. there's some, there was, there was, there's a lot of variations usable. And th those are the little directional prompts I was talking about, taking something that is so silly and so easy, but you make it seem difficult. Wow, what, what, what happened there? Those are the little surprises of success that really, really work with, with, with dancing. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is 11 o'clock. Um, <laughs> I've got my daughter coming home from her wedding here shortly. And for those of you in Australia, we have the Australia Callers Federation meeting coming up at 12, I believe, or is it 1230? 12 o'clock? Yeah, yeah, at 12. Sorry? 11.45, they start, yeah. 11.45, so in about 45 mi minutes. So uh, I do apologize. That's why I said today I was doing more of a lecture, and I figured I didn't actually expect that many questions on, on pattern filler. But I'm really glad all of you that stuck around and participated, very welcome. I do, for the newer callers, ask questions. For the experienced callers, make sure you teach these aspects of calling. Don't just focus on choreography, moving the dancers, or, or definitions and things like that. There's so much more to core skills. Um, I don't have anything scheduled for next Sunday. It's Anzac Day here in Australia. So if I do get something during the week, I will definitely post it up. But at the moment, I don't have anything scheduled. Um, Following that, May the 2nd, we've got Barry Watson coming on. He's going to be talking about note services, uh, advantages, disadvantages. They are caller's friends, but there's also pitfalls to note services. I'm still looking for filler for May the 9th and the 16th. And then we've got Jeff Priest coming in to talk about teaching basics, uh, how to teach and how to provide fun right from the beginning, which goes very, very much hand in hand what Glenn and uh, Ed were talking about right from the beginning and what John was talking about just a few minutes ago. So a lot of good things coming up. Thank you all for coming in. Uh, sorry to cut it short. Uh, I can leave the room open if, if you guys want to carry on and chat or if you want to look at things. Everybody should have allowance to screen share if you wanted to work with each other. But I'm going to have to beg off and say sayonara to all of you. And Thank I'll you, Mel. And, and I'll see yeah. you in, if not next week, in two weeks with Barry Watson. Cheers, Mel. Thank you, Mel. Thank you, Mel. Very good. Thank you. Very good. Bye, Mel. Bye, Bye, bye. Bye, bye. 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 Cheers. Bye, bye. Okay. So, did you guys want the room left open, or I wanted to? Uh, I wanted to uh, at the uh, at the. Oh, that's right. End, yes, sorry. Yes. Go uh, ahead. Uh, share the. Uh, 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 I think it'll play through the Zoom thing. Yeah, if you put it put it up on your screen and then put share screen, it, it should play through. Uh, yeah, it's the uh, the ultimate uh, patter tip with uh, illustrating all kinds of. Um, uh, okay, let's see if we can do this here. I thought it was an option that I already had turned on, but maybe not. Done the same. Oh, stop it. Uh, yeah, I, I was actually going to play that when I started talking about rhyming, the, the rhyming couplets. But I thought the session was long enough. I'm really glad you put that on there, Chris, or that you mentioned that. That is the one you were talking about? Uh, yeah, that's the that's the one. Uh, um, if anybody wants to go uh, uh, look at it, it's uh, Google for uh, hillbilly hair. Yeah, or Bugs Bunny Square Dance rap, Bugs Bunny Square Dance, any of those things, it'll it'll, it'll bring it up. Yeah. <laughs> Talking about smooth dancing. Well, <laughs> it was well timed, but actually, what what's the reason I was bringing was actually going to use that? If you look at it, everything's in that couplet that within the rhyming couplet, the commands are given. And it actually, they actually do, I mean, it's not square dancing per se, but it's, it's timed well with those eight beat phrases, what they do when the command lines are given, what they do, time to do the next one, time to give them the command, four beats, and then they go on to the next command. It's actually a very good example, but not of, <laughs> not of square dancing, but of delivery timing. It's an excellent example. I, I, yeah, I but it got really square dance calls in there, like fish trout oh, and yeah. stuff like that, really old figures. Oh, yeah. I, I, I mentioned one time to a friend of mine uh, who didn't know anything about square dancing. Uh, 
you know, that I just squirt dancing. And he looked at me and he goes, whirl, whirl, twist and twirl. <laughs> <laughs> he'd, seen, All right. he'd seen that. <laughs> yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, if nobody has anything else, I will end the session. Thank you all for coming in and sticking around and hopefully we'll see you if not next week in a couple of weeks. Bye y'all. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks Mel. Bye bye.